All right. Uh, we wanted to welcome John Perkins. Um, as you probably all are aware, uh, John Perkins was an econ economist at a major international consulting firm where he advised the World Bank, the IMF, the United Nations, the U.S. Treasury Department, Fortune 500 corporations, and leaders of countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East in the art of what he calls the global death economy. His former career positioned him well in his future life as a beacon of truth, exposing the corporate purpose behind the World Bank, IMF, and also free trade. A prolific author, Mr. Perkins' uh, well-known book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, was on the New York Times bestselling list for 73 weeks. His most recent new Confessions of an Economic Hitman is an updated version of his original work with added strategies to transform the global death economy into a regenerative model. Mr. Perkins is a founder and board member of Dream Change and the Pac Mama Alliance, nonprofits devoted to establishing a sustainable world model. And he has lectured extensively at Harvard, Oxford, and countless international universities. And in addition to his best known works of nonfiction, he has authored books on indigenous cultures and personal transformation. He has been featured on all major networks and print media, including the New York Times and the Washington Post. Some of John's classics include Confessions of an Economic Hitman, We All Know, The Secret History of the American Empire, Hoodwinked, and his most recent, New Confessions of an Economic Hitman, an updated, modernized version and follow-up to his international bestseller. Welcome, Mr. Perkins. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And you can call me John, please. <laughs> and I, I apologize for, for being late. I, I had some technical problems getting onto this call. In any case, um, so what I've been asked to speak about here is how economic hitmen hit the World Bank, IMF, trade agreements, and governments to create a death economy. You know, I'd like to start by, by saying that really um, I think economic hitmen have created the world's first truly global empire and it's a corporate empire it's not a not a national empire it's not an american empire it's it's a it's a corporate empire uh and we've done this and, and actually i also want to say that we, it, it ended up creating an economic system which i call predatory capitalism which obviously is not working in the world we, we've got uh, rising oceans melting glaciers less than five percent of the world's population lives in the united states we consume about 30% of the world's resources, well, roughly half the world is starving or on the verge of starvation. It's not a model. It can't be repeated by China, or India, or Brazil, even though they're trying, we can't do it. So I think the first question is, how did we get here? What's the, how did this economic hitman system work? You know, and um, I think I'm in a good position to talk a little bit about that since I was part of that process. And really what I did as an economic hitman uh, was to identify countries with resources our corporations covet, like oil, and then arrange a huge loan to one of those countries through the World Bank uh, or one of its sister organizations. And incidentally, my real title was chief economist at Charles D. Main, a consulting firm in Boston that was about 100 years old at that time. It, it's since gone out of existence, but we had about 2,000 consultants working for us, and I was chief economist. So I arranged this loan to a country with resources our corporations want, but the money would not go to the country. It would go to our own corporations, the, the Bechtel, Halliburton, Brown and Root, Stone and Webster, uh, common names, uh, to build big infrastructure projects in that country and make huge profits in the process of building the projects. These projects would help a few of the wealthy families uh, who own the industries, the commercial establishments, the banks, and so forth. They, they get rich off these projects. But the projects actually hurt everybody else because they, they, they took money that had been earmarked for education, health care, and other social services, and funneled it toward trying to pay the interest on the debt that the countries had taken on. 
And in the end, the country can't repay its debts. That's part of the plan. So we go back and say, since you can't pay your debt, sell your resource oil or whatever the resource is, cheap to our corporations without any environmental or social regulations. Privatize. Sell your electric utilities, your water and sewage system, your your schools, uh, your your prisons, your hospitals, everything <laughs> like that uh, to our corporations. And really, that in that way, we, we created this uh, economic hitman system. In the few cases where we fail, uh, the jackals, people we call jackals, go in and they either assassinate or overthrow governments. They're sponsored by the CIA. They're what's called CIA assets. And I talk in the New Confessions of an Economic Hitman, the book that's just out about how I failed with a democratically elected president of Ecuador, Jaime Roldos, and, and uh, Omar Torrijos, the head of state of Panama. They had integrity. They would not go along with these deals. And so uh, Jekylls went in and assassinated them. You know, and I, I want to say that I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist at all, and that I, I don't believe in some overarching conspiracy to take over the world. But I do know that there are conspiracies. I guess I'm a conspiracy factualist. Um, you know, I've read a lot of declassified documents, including the CIA's own website, where they admit that they have overthrown or assassinated uh, Prime Minister Mossadegh of Iran, uh, President Arbenz of Guatemala, President, uh, Prime Minister's DM of Vietnam, and Lumumba of the Congo, and perhaps best known of all is President Allende of Chile, who was replaced by the brutal dictator General Pinochet, who oversaw the murder of hundreds of thousands, or tens of thousands at least of his people, maybe hundreds of thousands, we're not sure, and was praised by Secretary of State Henry Kissinger as a great defender of capitalism. And so, you know, we really took capitalism to a different route here. When I went to business school, I was taught that a good capitalist, a good CEO, uh, makes a decent rate of return for his investors. This is in the late 60s. But he also is a good citizen. He makes sure that his company takes care of its employees, pays decent wages, provides health insurance and retirement pensions, and pays taxes. <laughs> and that these days. And also this corporation um, contributes to the local education systems and the recreational facilities and other things like that. He said that, that this corporation serves a public interest. That was ingrained in us when I was in business school in the late 60s, but that all changed in 1976 when Milton Friedman won the Nobel Prize in Economics. And amongst other things, Friedman said, the only responsibility of business is to maximize profits, regardless of the social and environmental costs. That changed everything. It gave CEOs the license, some would say, uh, the mandate to do whatever they thought it would take to maximize profits, including destroying the environment, um, overthrowing democratically elected governments, and investing a lot of money in lobbyists uh, to convince uh, the government to pass laws that allow corporations and people with lots of money to essentially control our political process, our election process. And I, I'd also like to say that when Milton Friedman uh, issued that statement in 1976 about maximizing profits, we believed that capital was in short supply and nature was abundant. So, in a way, Friedman may have been right. I'm not really criticizing Friedman for what he said at that time, but things changed a lot. Back then, nobody was talking about peak oil or climate change. Those weren't even considered, but they are today. Things changed very rapidly in this day and age. So, since 1976, the world has changed drastically. And now we know that nature is not abundant, and we know that we must change the rules. And so... These things like TTIP and TPP, these trade agreements, are part of this old system that is really looking at furthering corporate growth, furthering corporate power, making corporations more sovereign than, than countries. And I think, you know, we all need to be very suspect of any big major trade agreements that are, that are, that are crafted in private, in secrecy. I mean, why would these things be kept secret to my peer reason for that? 
And of course, now with the leaked documents, we're seeing some of the reasons why it was kept secret. We can also look to CAFTA and NAFTA, which really were the trade agreements upon which TTIP and TPP are based, uh, the Central American Free Trade Agreement and the North American Free Trade Agreement, which includes Mexico. And what we've seen terrible consequences from those agreements. And I'll just give one example, um, and, and that is that if, um, let's say it, it costs $5 for a big agro industry in the United States to produce a unit of corn. That same unit of corn could be, could have, in the past, could have been produced by a local farmer in Central America uh, for three dollars for the same unit. But the American farm industry gets a three dollar subsidy from the U.S. government. Therefore, that 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 farming company, that agribusiness can sell corn in Central America for something above $2, $2.5, let's say, and still make a profit. The local farmer has to sell for $3 or more because it costs him $3 to produce that unit. He is not subsidized. Those countries can't afford to subsidize their farmers. And CAFTA and NAFTA made it impossible for those countries to, to level the playing field by imposing a tariff or any kind of a, a tax on the imports from the agribusiness. And so what we find is that all these farmers in Central America had to stop farming. They couldn't afford to keep farming. And they are a large part of what we call our immigration problem today. So any politician who's saying we're going to stop the immigration problem by building a fence is, is looking at the wrong solution. The right solution is give these people back uh, their rights to farm and make a profit uh, without us subsidizing our farmers here and destroying them. The other thing that happens is suddenly all this, this land is vacant. These, these farmers left their lands. Big agribusiness has now gone down on those lands and is growing flowers, broccoli, things that are not consumed locally to, to export them or import them back to the United States. So it, it's a double whammy for these people. And it's also created a very cheap labor market in Central America. So uh, sweatshops are being developed because people are desperate, so they're going to work for less than less than living wage just to make anything they can because they can't live off the land anymore. It's a very sad situation, and that's what that's part of what NAFTA and CAFTA have done there. And in addition, of course, uh, they've they've cost a lot of jobs here in the United States. So they don't they haven't really helped anybody except the multimillionaires, the, the, the billionaires, the, the big businesses. T TTIP and TPP will do something similar on a much larger scale. Uh, and that's just one of the examples. So we're seeing a situation where this whole economic hitman system that I was part of developing, I'm ashamed to say, uh, back in the 60s and 70s, um, is now expanded. It's, it's spread uh, to the United States, uh, to, to Europe, and, and to the rest of the world. And, you know, what we're seeing happening in Greece, in, in, in Ireland, in Iceland, and in uh, Spain, and Portugal, and Brazil, and Argentina, all over the world is, is a reflection of this system. And what I say is that it's created a, what I'm calling, for lack of a better term, a death economy, an economy that's based on killing itself, consuming itself into extinction. In other words, it's an economy that's based on destroying the very resources upon which it depends, ravaging the earth. And also, it's an economy that's to a large degree based on warfare. It's based on exploiting people. We need to turn that around and create an economy that's based on a life economy that's based on things like cleaning up pollution. Let's invest in companies that, that mine the, all those plastic bottles floating around out in the ocean and, and all the, the, the spilled petroleum around filling stations all over the world and then the Amazon rainforest and the deserts of the Middle East. Let's create an economy that cleans up pollution. Let's create an economy that, be, that regenerates destroyed environments, that, that develops new technologies, efficient technologies for energy, transportation, communication, recycling and everything. We don't need to dig up the earth anymore. All the resources we need are right here. We just get to use them more effectively. And that opens the door for a whole new type of economic development. 
we don't have to go into a terrible crisis. We don't all have to go back and live in grass houses or caves or something like that. Um, that could happen if we keep going the route that we're going. We're, we're headed for disaster, there's no question. But there's an opportunity here to fairly easily shift our systems, our companies, our corporations, and move them away from uh, producing goods and services that are ultimately destructive and self-destructive into producing goods and services that will serve us in future generations. In, in other words, really what we're looking at here is creating an economic system that is itself a renewable resource. And we can do that. We, we have all the technology. We have all the systems we need to do that. We just need to make it happen. We need the will. We need to push it to happen. We need to recognize that big corporations control the world. You know, we've, we've in the United States, we've been going through this circus of the presidential election, which has just dragged on and on and on and on and on. And it's a distraction because what we really understand is that our president, all of our leaders throughout the world have very limited powers. But the big corporations really call the shots. And they're not evil. They're not good. They're not bad. They're just corporations. They're whatever we choose to make them. So it, it's up to us, all of us, to come together and insist that these corporations uh, do the right thing. They depend on us to buy their goods and services, to invest in them, to work for them, to manage them, and to support them through our tax dollars. Let's support corporations that are committed to creating a life economy, an economic system that is itself a renewable resource. Let's push them in that direction. And I have to say, I know a lot of corporate executives. I speak at a lot of corporate conferences. I coach corporate executives. I know a lot of these people. And I hear constantly, over and over from them, that I want to do the right thing, they'll say. But I'm afraid if I lose half a percentage of market share, my chief stockholders will fire me and replace me with someone who only cares about market share. So they ask, they tell me, go, go out and tell everybody you speak to to start a, a consumer campaign, and it's easy these days with, with social networking. Write an email, say, I love your products, company X, whatever it is. Pick your company, pick any company. You know, Walmart, uh, Chevron, Nike, and, and write them a letter and say, hey, I love your products. And we're not going to buy them until you pay your workers a fair wage or stop polluting or clean up the pollution that you've already caused. Or whatever, whatever the cause is, send that email but also to the company, but also send it to all your social networking servers and ask it to send it up to all of theirs and for everybody to send to that company. A lot of CEOs want to get those emails. They can take those to their main stockholders and uh, say, hey, you know, we got to change. We, we may lose a half percent of market share in the short run, but in the long run, we'll be a new leader. And so this whole system, the system that I developed with the World Bank and the IMF, and the IMF is really the kind of, it, it presents itself as the good guy. So in my, my story, I get these companies to take tremendous amounts of debt from the World Bank, the American Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, sometimes in consortiums with various Wall Street firms. And then when they couldn't pay their debt, and we go back and say, hey, you know, so sell your resources cheap, privatize. Uh, we'd also offer to restructure their debt. The, the IMF would come in as the good guy and say, hey, we'll help you restructure your debt. But the payoff always was uh, privatize. You know, if we're going to restructure your debt, then you've got to, you've got to do some things for us. Sell your oil cheap without restrictions to our company. Uh, privatize. So sell, your, sell all your various public sector businesses to our corporation. And that's kind of the role that the, that the IMF plays. And together, this whole system has created this failed economic system globally. It's not working. It's a failure. It isn't really capitalism. It's a, it's a terrible form of capitalism called predatory capitalism. We can turn it around. And I, we're in the process of turning it around. People all over the world are waking up. There's a consciousness revolution. We're understanding that we live on a fragile space station without shuttles, and we're steering it toward disaster. We can't get off, so we've got to change it. And I think we're getting it. And I think the fact that we're, we're doing this program right now is a good indication that people are getting it. 
So let's move forward and change it. I think this is an extremely exciting time to be alive. And as you can probably hear from my voice, I'm encouraged. We're on the right path, but we've just begun the path. We need to move rapidly down the path. We need to, we need to really get out there and, and make this happen. And I'm happy to get into more specifics about how we might do that. But I think I'll stop talking right now and <laughs> open this up to some questions or discussion and see where we want to go from here. Hello? Thank you so very much, John. Um, it was really amazing things that we basically suspected to actually hear someone on the inside say that's exactly what it was. Um, we're now going to open it up for questions and answers with John Perkins. If you have a question, and I already have some people on the stack, press star six on your phone, and then you will show up. All right, our first question, it looks like your area code 908, your line's open. Thank you, Mr. Perkins, for coming on the program. Uh, my name's Hugh Campbell from Union, New Jersey, and I deal with fraud on a daily basis. And there's three elements of fraud, one of which is rationalization, the other which is incentive or pressure, and the last is opportunity. And you mentioned Milton Friedman. I, I believe he also devilified greed, which gives a lot of corporations a rationalization for this predatory capitalism. Now, my question for you is, do free trade agreements uh, give the corporations the opportunity to practice this predatory capitalism? And would you consider these free trade agreements vehicles of crony capitalism? Thanks, Hugh. Uh, I think, uh, it, you know, there's never a simple answer to a question like that. It's not entirely black and white. Uh, but, yeah, in general, yes. The, the free trade agreements that, we, that, are, that we've seen in place so far, like CAFTA, NAFTA, uh, the World Trade Organization, et cetera, generally do that. They they encourage greed. They they follow the Milton Friedman kind of model. And again, I don't want to uh, turn you know I don't want to badmouth Friedman too much because we have to recognize that he was stating his principles at a very different time. It was 1976. It doesn't seem that long ago to some of us, uh, but things have moved very fast since then. Uh, and but in in essence, yes, what he was advocating was a very selfish, greedy approach to economics, quite different from the Keynesian uh, form that I was brought up with, which wasn't perfect either. And uh, so, yeah, we moved into this. We moved in very quickly into an era that was the era that was supported by uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, Margaret Thatcher, and many other world leaders. And, and in essence, has been endorsed by just about every major leader since then, including our presidents, Democrats and Republicans alike. But it's, you know, it's a perceived reality. Um, Friedman's philosophy is a perception. And I think it's, I'm getting a little philosophy myself here that, that, I, that we have to understand that there's, there's really there's two kinds of reality in the world. There's two basic kinds of reality. There's the objective reality, like the telephones or microphones or whatever we're all talking over. That's an objective reality. And then there's the perceived reality, which is pretty much the words we're speaking over these instruments. Countries are perceived reality. They don't really exist except as we perceive them and then codify them into laws. And then they have a big impact on objective reality. The same is true of corporations. The same is true of an economic system. So when Milton Friedman came along and he expressed this new view, which was quite different, as I mentioned, from what I was brought up with a decade earlier in business school, uh, it became a new perceived reality. But that means it's pretty easy to change it. We just have to, we have to create a new perceived reality. And I'd like to suggest that that new perceived reality is that corporations should make a decent rate of return for investors because we need investors to invest in a life economy. And they should go back to what I learned in business school, which is serve a public interest. The job of corporations should be to serve a public interest. And today that means creating a new kind of economic system that's a renewable resource 
a life economy, one that one that cleans up pollution, regenerates devastated environments, and basically honors and supports human and, and, and natural resources all over the planet. That should be the new rea- perceived reality, the new ideal, the new goal, the new rules that we go into. Thank you for that question. Thank you, John. Um, our next caller, you are at area code 250. Your line's open. Thanks very much. Uh, this is Alan Blaines uh, calling from Kelowna, British Columbia. Uh, I really appreciated your talk, John. Um, and it sounds like what you're talking about is a restoration of uh, indigenous governance principles uh, generally. Um, and I'm wondering if you have any advice for Idle No More or any of the other groups that are looking at replacing the colonialist uh, origins of justice administration uh, with uh, something that's more uh, in keeping with some of the, va- the basic principles of the original society, which is to put to investment as being a sacred process for the protection of Mother Earth and the uh, protection of the next seven generations. And I, I feel that, that that kind of approach to this would be a very uh, suitable way of tying up a lot of, uh, of uh, basic foundational support for, for creating a a resistance to some of these predatory practices. Well, thank you, Alan. Uh, Yes, um, I just, in fact, came from your country. I was just in Montreal and Quebec City. And I I grew up in northern New Hampshire. My my great, 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 great something grandmother was captured by Abnaki Indians, Algonquin-speaking tribe that was been taken to Canada and became a member of the tribe. I've always been very, very interested in that, and you may know that I've written five books on indigenous cultures. I spend a lot of time in the Amazon and with indigenous people in Colombia. In fact, I take groups of people every year to both the Amazon, to, to, to the Amazon, to Colombia, and to Guatemala, three different trips. I would love to have you join me, Alan, and other listeners. Just go to my website, johnperkins.org, and you'll find the trips there. I have been very influenced by the indigenous way, which has been extremely successful for thousands and thousands of years on this planet, of living with nature as part of nature, recognizing the incredible importance of a symbiotic relationship with nature. And I do think that's a, that's a very interesting and very good model. And I think it's time that we, we adapted that now to the fact that we're an awful lot of people living on a fragile space station, Earth, and we need to live within the context of this space station, this this beautiful Mother Earth. I, I, in a way, shouldn't call it a space station because that sort of implies an inanimate object. And I, I really think of the Earth as a living Earth. It's, it is. Uh, so we need to to understand that. And that's when I talk about a life economy. That's that's really uh, what I'm what I'm looking at and what I'm talking about. And I was struck especially being in Quebec City, which has such an incredible historic background and and where the coast of where my great, 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 great grandmother was taken. And and we see the the influence that the indigenous people had originally on the French and English settlers here who who learned to live with the land. But it didn't take long for the Age of Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, and so on to come along and convince everybody that the earth was just this vast resource that we could dig up and brutalize and ravage, and it would just keep giving and keep giving and keep giving. And we believe that until very, very recently. And now that we're all beginning to understand that that's just not the case, that that we've got to change our ways. And so, uh, yeah, I think the, the First Nations, if you want to call them that, the indigenous people, the Latin American ones so call themselves Indians, they, they kind of like that name. Whatever we call it, I think that, that the wisdom that comes out of that, of understanding that we are nature. We're not apart from nature. We are a part of nature. We are nature, and nature is us, and we need to honor that. And that's what a life economy will do. It's, it, that's what I mean by an economic system. It's a renewable resource that keeps renewing itself the way indigenous economies always have. Thank you very much, John. Our next Caller, caller, you're showing up as Susan. Susan, that's me. Um, yes, uh, I heard uh, John on the Shift Network. Uh, I couldn't take his course, but I was very impressed 
and when this came up today, I just said, I have to get on this call. And I just, uh, what Alan said, the whole idea of of uh, collective uh, consciousness and that we are all one and that we do need to take care of mother, our mother. We have to stop fracking and digging up her body. And, and I just, I have, this is what I've been working on. So when John came along, I, uh, how do we join together in this dream to make this shift again back to something that is connected? We're all connected, and I, I, uh, I just found out I was adopted, and I was told I was part Native American, Algonquin, from uh, maybe the Seneca Nation, and my DNA came back, no, but my connection with this attitude has always been with me so maybe my you know i have white guilt <laughs> about all of this because i'm all white whatever and i just feel so this is such a turning point right now and i'm so glad to be on this call and i was so glad to hear you on the shift network and we do need to shift with our brothers and sisters everywhere and um you know, I wanted to ask you, do you believe there is a presidential candidate who may be able to carry us forward? <laughs> Bernie Sanders. <laughs> I'm a Bernie person and I I you know I I feel this corporate attitude of suppressing the truth that we all are one and we need to work together is very strong and I'm just I just congratulate you for sharing where you came from and where you want to go. So I thank you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Susan. And incidentally, you know, we're all we're, we all have come from indigenous backgrounds, whether we're white or African American or indigenous, in, uh, you know, North American or South American or indigenous. Uh, white people too. We all come. <laughs> I am too. We, we all come from indigenous backgrounds. We all have that in our blood. We're all indigenous. To some place, we all have shamans in our background. And incidentally, the Shift Network, that's a seven series program, the, the, the an hour and a half, and it, it hasn't even begun yet. And if you sign up, you can, you don't have to take it just when it's offered. You can, you can, you can, go, you can participate at any time. And it's very powerful. And I, I'd encourage you to sign up and other people go to the Shift Network Google it or whatever, and it's it's about this. So how do we change this? That's exactly what, I, what I'm getting into. Shape shifting our reality is what, what that's about. Our personal reality and our global reality, and that's also a lot of what the New Confessions of an Economic Hitman is about. The whole last uh, 15 chapters are devoted to that, uh, and long list of things to do. We can all do things, and you know what what each of us can do is is often different. I'm a writer. I write. Whatever you do, you apply these principles to. And, and this again, long list in that book, and that is what we'll be going into in the Shift Network. So if anybody really wants to de- delve into this deeper, I uh, urge you to take the Shift Network program that I'm offering. And, and again, it's not time restrained. There are live programs, but they're also recorded. You can participate after they're they're done. Um, but you know, I, I I'll just I'll mention three examples of the many things that we can do. And one is uh, to use local and personal individual and community power to change laws. Um, you know, we, we the people have the power. You asked about presidential candidates. I, I love Bernie Sanders. I love what he's suggesting. But we've got to recognize that presidents just don't have that much power. If Sanders gets elected, he'll be surrounded by people that are just basically paid for by corporations. Uh, there's no question about it. Whoever gets elected, that'll happen. And so we have to recognize that in a democracy, we the people have to take their power, and we haven't done a good job of that recently. We didn't We didn't support Obama. You saw people who, who voted for him didn't stand by him, and Sanders himself says that he can't do it. We the people have to do it, and that's the first thing to understand is that we can't just expect that whoever we elect to change things. We have to do it. And, you know, we have a lot of power, especially 
if we look at the local level and we look at the individual level, everything starts locally, everything starts with an individual. Just recently, in the state of Vermont, with less than 0.2% of the U.S. population, less than 700,000 people, a small fraction of those people pushed through laws in Vermont that, uh, that made food companies label GMOs. And as a result, five of the largest food companies in the United States, ConAgra, Mars, Kellogg, General Mills, and Campbell's Soup, all announced that they would label GMOs in every state nationally. That was huge. And then I heard the CEO of Monsanto on the radio saying, this law is going to impact Monsanto. They're going to have to rethink their GMO policies. So a very small number of people in a very small state with less than 0.2% of the U.S. population forced to change is across the nation. That's power. And we the people have, have gotten rid of apartheid in South Africa back to when I was in college by, 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 by forcing companies to boycotting and changing laws and forcing companies not to support apartheid. We've gotten corporations to clean up terribly polluted rivers, to open their doors wider to women and minorities, on and on and on. And the Vermont example is just one of many recent ones. Um, and so, you know, pressure your local governments as well as your national governments to change laws that really help us create an, an economic system that's a renewable resource. That's one thing we all can do. And it's easy today with, with social networking to do that. Second thing is convince corporations to become public servants. Uh, again, CEOs know what they – if they get flooded by emails, they get the message. And so I would encourage everyone, as I said earlier, pick a corporation. Susan, pick some corporation that you want to change and start a campaign by just sending them one email, you know, maybe every week. It says, I love your products, but, but I won't buy them until you change and get everybody you know every so, on your social network circle to get everybody they know on theirs to keep sending these emails. That has power. And the third thing is to recognize that we must search out and spread the story behind the story. My economic hitman story highlights the fact that there's almost always another story behind the official Story, you know, in, in recent revelations like those of WikiLeaks and the uh, Panama Papers and Edward Snowden, and, and as well as, as some investigative journalists like those at the Pulitzer Prize-winning ProPublica and um, and uh, Amy Goodman and Common Dreams. I mean, there's so much going on out there that's exposed corrupt politicians and tax evading billionaires. Um, we have to understand that democracy depends on us, you and me, not the president, but you and me uh, exposing the truth. It depends on transparency. It demands that we have skepticism. It demands that we question what our leaders are doing in political policy, no matter who gets elected. We've got to question that constantly and push them to do better. So whoever... You know, whatever it is you like about Sanders, and there's a lot I to like about Sanders, but pick, pick a couple of issues. And if he gets elected, make sure he promotes those issues. Support him in it. Push him and support him. Let him know you're supporting If he doesn't get elected, um, then push those issues anyway. You move forward with them. Start your own movement, political and, 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 and uh, consumer movement, to make sure those things happen. But the important thing is for all of us to act to realize that other leaders can't do it, they're not going to do it, they don't have the power to do it. Uh, we have to do it. We have to give them the power. We have to make it happen. Thank you, John. Um, our next question, caller, you're at 585. Hi, uh, John. This is Paul Plantford from Rochester, New York. Uh, and thank you for uh, being part of the and for accepting Pachamama Alliance. I've twice attended the Awakening the Dreamers Symposium in Rochester, New York, and I'm a friend of Sue Sarpoli's. Um, a couple of questions. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, very briefly, um, can an economic hitman intimidate or influence the president of the United States? Say, say United that States? again, Paul. I, you broke up on me. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll, I have uh, two two questions. I'll ask very briefly, and then I'll uh, I'll be silent. One is. Can an economic hitman intimidate or influence 
the President of the United States, and secondly, regarding Ecuador, can you elaborate on recent developments particularly related to the Chinese influence? Sure. Uh, in answer to your first question, absolutely. The president or all of our major leaders are extremely vulnerable. And we have to we have to understand that. Is that uh, even if we get a president that's accepting no money from a corporation, and, and and both Sanders and Trump are saying that they're not doing that, they'll still be surrounded by congressmen and, and senators who who have accepted a lot of money, and and who know that when they leave Congress, whether they lose elections or just decide to leave. They'll get very lucrative jobs as lobbyists and consultants. So whoever the president is, he's going to be surrounded by economic men and controlled by them to a large degree. Uh, also, we have to recognize that the president is very vulnerable. Uh, you know, we, 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 we saw with – President Kennedy had lots of sexual relationships with lots of different women. It, it didn't hurt him. Uh, it, it, they had to take him down with a bullet. Uh, but we saw in the Clinton that a uh, sexual situation uh, got him impeached. Uh, and, you know, I imagine that everybody has skeletons in their closet. But even if we, we got a president that had no skeletons, the FBI can create them. With the access to the Internet and, and all of our uh, communications, anybody can be thrown out of office. It doesn't take a bullet to assassinate a president anymore. Politically, you can be assassinated by a, a rumor. So our presidents are very vulnerable. We need to recognize that. They're in a very, very difficult position. As to Ecuador, and that's a good example there, President Rafael Correa, who I have, have thought highly of and uh, has endorsed one of my books and says, you know what I say in Confessions of an Economic Hitman, is he's experienced it. He's in a very difficult position. He's, this is in his eighth year, and he originally really stood up to the oil companies, uh, and he 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 refused to pay 3.7 billion dollars worth of debt that I had helped shove off on on the military junta that ran president that ran Ecuador in the 70s. Uh, you know these were corrupt people, and I corrupted them. I, I'm not bragging about it, that's for sure. But at the time, again, I believed that these things were right because I've been taught in business school this is the way you do things. Build these big infrastructure projects. Korea refused to pay $3.7 billion worth of that debt. He said, Maybe people don't owe it. Maybe the, the old military juntas do, but they're all gone. They've either died or they've moved to Miami or Switzerland or someplace. The World Bank owes us the money back again. We don't need to pay it back to them. And maybe John Perkins and the other economic hitmen ought to be paying this money back, but we're probably not going to get it from them because they they're not wealthy. And so he refused to pay it. Of course, the IMF and uh, – all the rating agencies, Moody's and the others, downrated Ecuador's credit, credit rating significantly. The Chinese stepped forward and gave Korea and Ecuador a billion-dollar bridge loan and made it easy for them to start paying it back. So the credit ratings went back up. And then he's taken more and more money from China. A few years ago, the United States was buying 55% of Ecuador's oil, and it looked like it was going to increase to almost 100%. Today, we're not buying any oil. It's all going to the Chinese. What, what, what's being taken out is going to the Chinese. Ecuador has now a cozy relationship, a dependence on China. And when I ask the Ecuadorian officials how they feel about this, they say, well, you know, we know that the United States assassinated one of our presidents, Jaime Roldos. We know that they took out Allende. They built a huge military base here in Ecuador. Korea kicked it out. Uh, they have assassinated uh, leaders throughout the world. Uh, they've exploited us. We don't trust the United States. And I say, well, don't you think China's going to do the same thing? And they say, well, maybe, but it hasn't. And who are you going to, you know, if you've got to get, get money from somebody, who are you going to get into bed with? The person that you suspect may turn against you or the one that you know from history has that reputation, has that historical precedent that they do turn against you. And so China's making inroads. And in Latin America, Africa, around the world, partly because we've made some awful mistakes. The World Bank has made some awful mistakes. The IMF has made some awful mistakes. Um, and if we really want to turn China around, we need to set a new model. The United States is still looked at as a world leader. People look to us for answers, for leadership. We need to really lead and create a life economy. That's the best way to turn this thing around and to get China and everybody else to get on board and turn it around, too. Appreciate your question. And, John, thank you so much. 
for that incredible Q&A period. People are just joining this act, but unfortunately, we need to move on and continue on with our webinar. Now, what I'm going to say for all the people who were unable to ask your question, and I have never seen so many people in the queue, you can type your question in the chat box if they're on your computer, and we will get that to John, or email your question to me. And my email is Andrea at peopledemandingaction.org. And so, John, you're probably tomorrow going to get a big email from me with a group of questions. And then what we're going to do is when you answer, we will post the answers and the questions on both our Facebook page and also on the website page. So, John, if you stay with us for the balance of our call or at well, least our next speaker, we would be thrilled. Yes, and uh, Andrea, I've got to say that I'm, I'm headed out and I'm on the speaking tour. It's going to be very difficult for me to answer all those questions. I hadn't I hadn't assumed I was going to do this. What I would really like to suggest is that if people want to pursue this further, join my course on the Shift Network or go to my website, johnperkins.org, and come in one of the places where I'm speaking or a workshop I'm giving in Esalen or Omega or come on one of the trips with me. I, I apologize. I, I probably just will not answer any or many of those questions simply because I – I'm, I'm, I'm scheduled. Uh, outrage, I've got an outrageous schedule <laughs> in the next, for the next six well, months, actually. So it's going to be very all hard. Right. Well, well thank you, John. So people, don't email me. Don't email me at all. Um, we put John's website um, in the chat box, johnperkins.org. So go there, check John's schedule, sign up for one of his courses, and again, thank you so very much for joining us. It was amazing. Now, so last, Dre was speaking to us about Keith Kip and what is going on in Washington, D.C. A lot more people have joined uh, because you were pinch hitting early on. So, so let's um, bring us up to speed on D.C., please. Great. So I was um, I had just explained what TTIP is. Um, if you missed that part, just Google TTIP and you can find out. Um, so Greenpeace uh, in Europe received somehow 16 documents, uh, memos, and negotiating texts of the TTIP, um, and there were several uh, leaks of this sort during the TPP, but this was a huge dump of documents. And if you Google TTIP leaks, you can, of course, read the documents for yourself. But what's amazing is what's happened as a result of these leaks. So French President Hollande has said, if this is the direction TTIP is going, France says no, just an outright rejection. In addition, there's a lot going on in Germany. The Green Party, which was already against it, is now explaining what it has found in the documents to stir up additional uh, outrage against it. In Rome, uh, there was a 30,000-person march, um, not quite as big as the one that they had had in Hanover, but very, very large and actually larger than what the organizers were planning on. Um, Slovenia has come out um, and said that it, if the CETA, which is the Canadian-European uh, Trade and Investment Agreement, and the TTIP go forward, it does not want the investment court system, which is just a euphemism for a slightly revised um, but terrible investor-to-state dispute settlement system. It's these 
special systems of private justice for foreign investors. Slovini has said it will oppose them if it has the ICS in, in these two agreements. So more countries are coming out and speaking up about what is the what is going into these agreements, why what's going in is totally different from what the negotiators are saying publicly and demanding their say if these agreements do get completed and and a way to vote on them. It's a it's a complicated system in Europe where if something is considered a mixed agreement that is both under the jurisdiction of the European Commission, sort of the European body and the national government, then it has to be approved by both the European uh, Parliament and the European Council and national governments. So the more that countries fight for it to be a mixed agreement, the more they could have a say of one country actually taking it down. So that's what's been going on. I encourage people to look because this could really be a turning point and force a really force ISDS or any form of it out of the TTIP or or take down the TTIP based on what it looks like now because what it looks like now is totally against all the promises being made about it's not going to lower standards. Um, and that's a positive sign for what we're dealing with with TPP. In other words, waking people up to the fact that these are not simply tariff reduction agreements, but they are agreements about how we will regulate and run our economies and taking away national choices. So this is a, a positive thing for trade around the world. And meanwhile, the the proponents are saying the same old line like, oh, these leaks don't show that much, which of course is easy for them to say because they know very few people will read the leaks themselves or have the uh, background in trade law to understand what the leaks say. And their real big excuse is, well, you know, we have to do TTIP uh, and TPP and CETA and these other agreements because the other alternative is just uh, ending trade. And we, we can't end trade. And that's just a, a ridiculous straw man that we all know better. There are many ways to do trade, and this is about the rules. Um, the second thing I want to talk about that's happening in D.C. this week that's going to be a big deal is today is the fourth anniversary of the U.S.-Columbia Free Trade Agreement. And in honor of that anniversary at the AFL-CIO, we are bringing up uh, from Columbia the heads of two of the Colombian trade union confederations, so the equivalent of the AFL-CIO there, um, plus two experts from the National Union School there, which is a think tank that works on labor issues, and they are going to do a press conference. They're going to meet with members of Congress. They're going to meet with members of the administration, and they're going to talk about why the labor chapter model in the Columbia Free Trade Agreement, which is almost a carbon copy of what's in the TPP, doesn't work, hasn't worked. 99 union leaders have been assassinated since the beginning of the U.S. Columbia FTA. Um, illegal labor intermediation, which is just a fancy word for structuring uh, how you hire employees to prevent them from joining unions. That practice is actually up since the beginning of the FTA. Um, the government is not using all of the new laws that it passed that were designed to promote uh, worker rights and workplace rights. So in other words, it's a big failure and it's a big should be a big warning to Congress about if you believe these promises about TPP and labor, you shouldn't, and here's evidence and here's why. So um, I will stop there and hand it over to Adam. All right. Thank you, Celeste. All right. We are going to bring up another member of our cross climbing team, Adam Weissman. Um, Adam, I did unmute your line for you, so you should be able to speak. Adam is with Global Justice for Animals and the Environment and also with Trade Justice. So, Adam, Adam is going to give us an update on news and events. Hi, everyone. Um, and just to, to start, I just want to let people know that the what I'm going to be giving you here is a very brief summary 
of the much more extensive information that you can get from the newsletters that we produce uh, in association with every one of these calls. If you'd like to read the, the full newsletter, which has much more information than I'll be able to cover here, go to tradejustice.net uh, slash news, and you'll see the, uh, the link to the full newsletter. I'm also, Andrea, just to let you know, uh, going, I, I couldn't get the webinar open, uh, so I'm just working for my initial slides. So I may, uh, if I have a title slide, uh, then it'd be a good, good time to advance to the next. I'm on the next slide. Excellent. Great. Okay. So um, big, in addition to uh, TTIP seemingly coming apart at the seams, uh, TPP looks like it is in big trouble. Maybe my favorite TPP headline ever came out in Politico this week, TPP Death Watch. Uh, President Obama is making a heavy uh, propaganda push on TPP. Some of us were unsuccessful uh, last week in trying to get on the business forward conference call that President Obama spoke on pushing TPP. He also had a recent editorial in the Washington Post, which also ran in the, uh, sorry, in the New York Post, maybe the first time the New York Post has decided they felt the need to hear, uh, to give Barack Obama a forum. Um, meanwhile, Hillary Clinton has strengthened her opposition to TPP. She's saying that she uh, opposes the TPP vote before and after the election. She opposes a lame duck vote. In a more recent TV interview, she used a more uh, guarded wording, saying she opposes TPP in its current form, but uh, supports a, the creation of a new position of a trade prosecutor. Uh, the political article talks about some of the glum prospects for TPP and how people like Mitch McConnell uh, don't, at this point, uh, have any real optimism about a path forward. Um, Tom Donahue from the Chamber of Commerce is still maybe the last person saying, uh, speaking about TPP as as, a, as something likely to happen, but uh, prospects at this point look bleak. That does not mean that we need to in any way let up our efforts. A lame duck vote is very much something that the administration is still pushing for, but it means that if we keep fighting, we will win. Next slide. Okay. So the, we just heard a little bit from Celeste about the U.S.-Columbia Free Trade Agreement, a very disturbing piece of news. It looks like the U.S. trade representative may be strong-arming Colombia. Uh, in Colombia is potentially going to be getting peace funding after decades of war funding. Um, and as, as the peace negotiations progress in Colombia, well, it looks like the U.S. TR may be trying to uh, tie that to uh, undermining Colombia's access to medicines in the process directly undermining part of the May 10th commitment that was built into the us Columbia Free Trade Agreement. The May 10th commitment was the language that was added to the revised version of the Bush-era FTAs that was basically a Band-Aid that was supposed to give Democrats political cover to pass uh, uh, Bush trade deals and actually did have some genuine improvements on labor and environment and access to medicines, but many of us would argue, and history has borne out, did not make those agreements worth passing. Well, it looks like USPR is looking to push back even on those protections now uh, and strong arming the Colombian government. The WTO fight around, uh, around dolphin tuna, around dolphin safe labeling on, tunas conti on tuna continues. The U.S. has pushed for a uh, compliance panel that would uh, – arguing that they've expanded their dolphin tuna program so that it is no longer discriminatory against Mexico, covering more fisheries. Meanwhile, Mexico at the same time is pushing for a panel uh, claim, demanding that it can, arguing that it wants to get compensation uh, so because of the saying that the, uh, for the U.S. continuing to, in Mexico's position, uh, restrict Mexican, Mexico's right to sell dolphin unsafe tuna without labeling in the U.S. Uh, moving on to TTIP. Um, as we heard, uh, the Greenpeace leaks have uh, been a major uh, setback for TTIP. It did, uh, some additional points in that regard. Greece is now saying that they will not agree to TTIP without geographical indications, which are sort of intellectual property protections on food names, saying that food produced in a local area has the, in a particular, with traditional food, has the traditional, has the unique right to use those particular names in relation to food. A new report was released by uh, Friends of the Earth Europe, talking about how TTIP threatens farmers. The European Commission released a new report with uh, which groups like War on Want uh, argue, and well, the report itself argues that uh, TTIP seriously threatens health, uh, environmental, and, and uh, climate protections uh, in Europe. So this is the European Commission itself saying this. 
so, and uh, there's also analysis of the Greenpeace leak saying that TTIP threatens net neutrality and citizens' rights. So TTIP is in trouble. Moving um, and in moving on to the next slide, you, there are links to some of these reports, and we should all, and as well as the Greenpeace leaks, these are the kind of documents we should be forwarding to our elected officials and their staff. Uh, next slide. Okay, the Left Forum is coming up in New York City from May 20th to May 22nd. For those of you planning on coming to the Left Forum or who haven't considered it yet but may now, there are numerous workshops dealing with trade policy. These are great opportunities for us to learn more, great opportunities to network, and also great opportunities to let people know about our webinars. We have uh, flyers that you can download to let people know about the webinar that we'll be having that Sunday night. Uh, so if anyone wants a copy of that flyer, you can go to the Facebook event for the 522 webinar, the May 22nd webinar, which you can find uh, linked from the Trade Justice website or from the by going to our Facebook group, which is Trade Justice Alliance. And if anyone can't find that, just email me, adam at tradejustice.net, and I'll be happy to email that to you. Uh, some of us will also be leafleting outside the left forum and tabling if anyone wants to help with that. But do please, if you're around, check out some of these uh, workshops. Lots of great information about trade policy, including TPP. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, that same weekend, somewhat conveniently and somewhat inconveniently, is the March Against Monsanto. The global day of March is all around the world protesting Monsanto, which, as we all know, is one of the corporations that stands to benefit from deals like TPP and TTIP and that has been pushing them in order to roll back protections against bee-killing pesticides, to roll back GMO labeling rules. So one of the things that we're going to do is pass out leaflets that let some of the activists who are participating in these march to know why people are calling TPP and TTIP the Global Monsanto Protection Act. Linked uh, on, the, on the screen you can see, which will be available in the PowerPoint that you download or in the Trade Justice Newsletter, is a flyer and form letter that you can, that you can download that we'll be putting up a revised version of the form letter tonight. There's a current version already of the letter. So again, you can go to tradejustice.net slash news to get all, all these links. And I will be back with you at the end of the call uh, telling you about our upcoming webinars, but I'll turn over for now to Q&A. Thanks, everyone. All righty, great. Oh, I missed out of the last slide. All right, um, if anyone has any questions for Celeste or Adam, and I've got questions, star six. Um, Q, go ahead, your line's open. Hello, Campbell. Um, Hello. Adam, um, if, President Obama signs TPP in the, as a result of a lame duck vote. Won't his legacy be an end run around democracy? And couldn't we petition him and some of the, many of the people in Congress that this shouldn't be his legacy? Well, many people are doing that, um, and I know Margaret, who's going to be speaking later in the call, is going to be talking about the no lame duck mobilization, the no lame duck TPP mobilization. And I know a lot of groups, uh, Celeste can probably also speak to that, are pushing very much this message that there should not be a lame duck vote on TPP, that this kind of, that this critical legislation that will make, uh, basically will be committed to uh, for generations to come should not be happening in, in, at the period when elected officials are least accountable. Hillary Clinton has now committed to that position, as, as I mentioned before, as well. Um, so that there really is a strong push for that position, but we really need to keep hammering that message home at our elected officials that taking a vote on TPP during, well, taking a vote in general is, is unacceptable, but taking a vote on TPP during that period is an especially egregious affront to democracy. And Celeste, do you want to add anything to that? Celeste, do you want to add anything? Maybe Celeste is muted. Celeste, are you muted? She shouldn't be. Um, okay, well, why don't we move on to the next question? Maybe Celeste can. Go. All righty, next question. Um, Lisa, is that you? Yes, I'm here. Um, I have a question for either Celeste or Adam. Um, 
The new report was due out uh, May 15th. I think it was called the IRC report. Uh, have you heard anything about that? The, the ITC report, the Inter International Trade Commission ITC report. ITC report, yeah, that's, that's it. Yeah, that's coming out May 18th. Uh, we're going oh, the to 18th. Be, okay. So uh, we're, the... And we're actually going to be doing a call on June 19th with analysis of that report. Also, in the newsletter, uh, the very first thing in the newsletter, Public Citizen is urging all of us to write to our elected officials now to tell them that they shouldn't be fooled by the ITC hype, and they have an online action alert that you can use to send that message very easily to your elected officials. Again, go to tradejustice.net slash news, click that first news uh, link there, and the very first item after the table of contents will be that action alert that you can use. Um, Plus, do you want to add anything? Uh, no, just that, well, I would just say it's due on the 18th, which is Wednesday, but um, there's really no penalty. Uh, there's nothing to prevent them from publishing it earlier, and there's no penalty if they publish it later. So we just have to be aware it could be uh, coming out any day this week, or if it doesn't come out this week, we just have to be on ITC Report Watch. All right. Um, thank you, Celeste and Adam. Coming up next is Dr. Margaret Flowers, who has been a regular on these calls and webinars. Dr. Margaret Flowers is a doctor, she's a pediatrician, and she's co-chair of the Maryland Chapter of Physicians for a National Health Program, PNHP. Margaret is also co-director of popularresistance.org, and it's our economy, and she's co-organizer of Watch the EPP. And Margaret is a the Green Party candidate for U.S. Senate in Maryland. So, Margaret, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Andrew, for having me on the call. Thanks to everyone who's on the call tonight. So I'm with... Um, as Andrew said, with Popular Resistance and Flush, the TPP. And I just want to go over a few of the upcoming events because um, it's really amazing news that we're winning this fight. And um, five years ago, if you'd asked me, I would not have been this optimistic that we would be in this position. But I'm a long-distance runner, and I know that when you're winning the race, you don't stop running until you cross the finish line. So that's what we're doing this year. We're continuing to organize and mobilize to cross that finish line. A couple of things that are coming up around the um, the U.S. economic uh, U.S. ITC economic impact statement. We've created our own people's economic impact statement, and we're telling the TPP truth by getting that out. There's a six-page statement as well as a two-pager bullet point uh, document. Those are available on flushthetpp.org. If you look on the actions page, you'll see the TPP Truth Campaign, and you can download those. We encourage you to use those for teach-ins as well as giving those to your members of Congress so they'll have accurate information uh, to counter the USITC report. We are also doing an action on Wednesday, um, May, May 18th, the day that the report is due, at the USITC at noontime. We're connecting with our friends who are doing a week of protests around the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission focused on the climate crisis. And so we're uh, connecting those two issues and calling it a uh, there are no jobs on a dead planet rally. We'll be rallying at the USITC and then we'll march over to the Democratic National Party headquarters and deliver the people's economic impact statements there. So if you're in the D.C. area, we encourage you to join us. You can go to our Facebook page, Flush the TPP Facebook page, and uh, get more information about that there. Then we're also organizing around the DNC convention in Philly. Um, there's going to be a March for a Clean Energy Revolution, and we have an, an official contingent in that march to, to stop the TPP contingent. And so if you're in the Philadelphia area or planning to come, to Philly for the DNC, please join us on Sunday, July 24th uh, for that March for Clean Energy Revolution. And that is also available on our Flush the TPP Facebook page or on the action map at flushthetpp.org. As Adam mentioned, we're organizing to protest the lame duck, and we'll be starting with a call-in 
and uh, email campaign starting at the end of this month focusing on members of Congress to tell them exactly what Adam said, that there should not be a vote on something that's important uh, during the lame duck. In fact, we don't think there should be a lame duck. And actually, in the past, there have been uh, no lame duck sessions. So there is a precedent for this. Um, and we have more than a thousand people in almost 100 organizations that have signed on to that campaign so far, as well as almost 400 people who have said they could come to DC uh, to protest, and then others who will do actions at home. So we really encourage you to sign up for this. We need a lot of people. The fact that we can say that thousands of people are signing up in itself is very powerful. So please go to flushthetpp.org. No lame duck and sign up for that. And then we have our uh, every other Wednesday night organizing calls. The next one is May 25th, and that's at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. And on that next call will be Evan Greer from Fight for the Future, letting us know about actions that she's organizing, a really exciting concert series, as well as we'll be launching the call-in tool. And we'll have uh, someone from Food and Water Watch on talking about the March for Clean Energy Revolution. It's also a great place where people uh, share what they're doing around the country, and there are always you know, great ideas that people talk about on those calls. So I encourage you to join those uh, Wednesday night calls. Every other Wednesday night, May 25th is the next one. If you go to flushthetpp.org, it's at the top of the news page, and you can register for that call. So thank you very much, Andrea, and I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Margaret. Always wonderful to hear about all the amazing things that you are doing in addition to running for U.S. Senate. Our next speaker is um, an activist. Her name is Stacy Coxey, and she is from Spokane, Washington. She is also moved to amend, and there is a marvelous campaign that AC is working on, and we're, I'm going to have AC tell you about her campaign. AC, welcome. Well, thank you very much. I, um, I'm blessed to have a volunteer who's very, very creative and was able to put together this brochure that you see in front of you. We are calling it Satire to Vism, um, with the thought that, you know, when you do so much activism, at one point, you know, the emails and the visits, you know, to those that are getting visited, you know, it just may be like rain on the roof, you know, oh, here's another email, oh, here's another visit. And so this is a little more uh, surprising, um, and uh, it is satire. Uh, on uh, last Tuesday, I actually uh, took this and um, a brochure for Move to Amend for their HJR 48, Get Big Money Out of Elections by Reversing Corporate Personhood and Money is Political Speech, I took both of these uh, brochures uh, and dropped them off in all 435 offices of the House of Representatives. I did it in four hours. Um, and if you can't actually see that, I don't see it very well. Let me, this is a, it's a pizza box, actually. You'll love it or we'll sue you, TP Pizza. And it says on the inside, dear hardworking congressional staff, it's lunchtime. Enjoy this complimentary TP pizza. Yum. Sorry, we can't say where the meat came from or what drugs were used on the livestock or what herbicides or pesticides are included or untested GMOs. It's all going to be legal, so it must be safe to eat, right? Just so long as all the corporations involved make a profit for their shareholders, which, of course, a vote for the TPP will ensure. Bon Appetit, your constituency and Spokane against the TPP. P.S. Take home a slice or two for your kids lunch tomorrow. Um, I have to say that um, got quite a few laughs out of this. And um, and uh, do you have the menu on there as well on the next uh, slide by chance? We do. Uh, let me jump ahead. Oh, no? Okay. Go. So we also did, and I don't know if the slide will show or not, 
but we did a um, an activity in front of our um, there you are our local um, democracy uh, Spokane Democratic meeting. I and so another volunteer and I dressed up uh, really nicely, stood outside the door and handed out the TPP dinner menu, um, which was we got. Um, of the probably 150 people that went in, we only had one person who said, oh, well, I'm, I'm actually for the TPP. We're in Washington State. Why wouldn't we? In fact, I just got done um, testifying on Capitol Hill, and I thought, oh, okay, well, that answers it. <laughs> Everybody else was like, oh, my gosh. Um, I think my personal favorite is the shredded sovereignty salad, uh, which is finely shredded American sovereignty dressed with fresh corporate power to overrule local, state, and national laws and to impose fines, including a zesty recovery of imaginary lost profits. Um, and so that's just kind of the creative um, marketing we're doing, just trying to break through uh, the uh, the natural defense you know, that people have uh, to other ideas uh, with something, you know, maybe maybe sovereignty they is too abstract, but pizza they get. <laughs> so um, that's all I had. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Stacey. And, again, this is just such a wonderful idea. And, again, it's got all the details but it's presented in a fun way that will really make people think. Um, I want to bring up next Mark Cohen. She is another member of our planning team. She works with me on the NMAP criminalization team and also um, Agitator Radio. Mara is going to talk to you about the Organizers Resource Hub. So, Mara. Go ahead. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a really great call tonight, a lot of information, and moving on into organizing. Um, John always ends his books with uh, ways of organizing to resist. And um, I want to talk about the new organizing resource hub that you've heard a little bit about before so that we can get organizing now. Um, we have a group of people who have, we've identified already, self-identified, who want to help in any way that people need it to grow organizing in their communities so that they will be ready to act um, on a local level. So, I, you know, in, in talking to Margaret and Stacy, it seems that it would be good to try to get some camaraderie and uh, knowledge of each other and organizing get uh, going in the communities so that in July um, we can go to the DNC or do it in our own backyard to give the Democratic Party a very strong uh, message that they're not going to get away with these free trade agreements. So um, I was talking to Stacy about using the menu if if we're looking at uh, only uh, congressional deliveries because they just had their pizza and we don't want to give them too much pizza. So although if you're delivering to corporations or stakeholders or whatever, pizza's just fine to do again. And menus have not been delivered, so a menu delivery would be great too. Um, I want to invite everybody to come to the resource hub. You probably have an awful lot of um, talent out there, people who have made creative ideas, people who've made really good contact with the press, people who are just really great at doing flyers, whatever it might be, and then whatever kind of help you need, you can turn to us. So um, my email address is on the slide, and we'll get back to you quickly. Uh, you know, I'll read the email, and we'll see who's best suited to helping you out with it, and we'll um, we'll get in touch that way. So please feel free to email. Thank you, and check. Thank you very much, Mara. Uh, we're now going to have a Q&A with our 
three activist, Margaret Flowers, Stacey Coxey, and Mara Cohen. So if you've got any questions for those three, remember star six, and that will add you to my question and answer queue. And as usual, Margaret and Mara do such a great job. And Stacey, you are absolutely fun and delightful tonight. We don't have any questions for our activist team. All right. I'm going to bring Adam back up to talk about our upcoming call because we are going to be fighting the PPP until it is dead and done for. Adam, I'm checking to see if you are. Hi. There you are. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, it's muted. Okay, so we have a great series of calls coming up. Uh, in one week, we're, uh, normally we do calls every two weeks, but because of the Memorial Day holiday, we have a call in one week. Also, because one week from now is International Day for Biological Diversity, which is a great opportunity for us to debunk the Obama administration's lies that TPP is a pro-wildlife trade deal. We've heard all kinds of spin from the administration about how TPP is going to help shut down the ivory trade and uh, do all this great stuff for or the illegal ivory trade, and do all this great stuff for wildlife. Well, unfortunately, uh, just the opposite is true. And Ben Beachy from the Sierra Club's Responsible Trade Program and Chris, Chris Wold from uh, Lewis and Clark Law School's uh, International Environmental Law Program will set the record straight about how TPP will actually be a step backwards, not a step forward for wildlife protection. And for anyone who would like to help get the word out about uh, this call, this is a great opportunity to reach out to conservation groups, animal protection groups, um, environmental groups, and really let them know about the critical opportunity to uh, this critical opportunity to learn the facts about this trade deal. Uh, you can send them to the Facebook link. You can also contact me if you'd like to to do that in a more organized fashion. We're going to. Uh, See if we can get groups, if they ask groups if they want to add their names as co-sponsors to this webinar. I'm at adam at tradejustice.net. So that is su next Sunday, uh, the 22nd of May. Then uh, we'll be off for Memorial Day weekend. And then uh, going into the next slide, on June 5th, we will be, which is, the, which is World Environment Day, and is also one day before the anniversary of a grim event, the Bagua Massacre, in Peru, which was a massacre of indigenous people that's been described as the Amazon Tiananmen Square. It was in a, a crackdown on an indigenous uprising that was uh, that took place uh, in response to a legislative decree uh, put forward by the president of Peru uh, in his, uh, as he framed it, in order to implement his commitment to the U.S.-Peru Free Trade Agreement and, in reality, to steal indigenous people's land. So on that day, we'll be having two guest speakers. Uh, one just confirmed this evening is Bill Weinberg of World War IV Report. Uh, you can check out his website, worldwar4report.org, who will be talking about the Bagua Massacre and the events leading up to it and its connection to the free trade agenda. Then uh, we'll be welcoming back Wendy Stephanie, who spoke uh, on one of our webinars just recently, who will be talking about the uh, fight against the fight. Uh, who will be talking about the fight against TPP in Peru today as uh, Peru moves uh, towards a very frightening political direction. Activism is growing against against TPP, and she'll be talking about the grassroots movement to stop uh, this terrible trade deal uh, in order to stop the ongoing damage that free trade is doing to Peru. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And th because on the 19th, as I mentioned earlier, we will be talking about the ITC report and uh, debunking some of what we expect to be in, in that report. The ITC, the U.S. International Trade Commission, has a history of giving very rosy reports about what ultimately turned out to, turn out to be disastrous trade deals, and we unfortunately expect that we'll be, see more of the same this time around. Well, fortunately, uh, Jeremy Capaldo, who was the author of the Tufts University report that we heard about a few months back, which was the most uh, critical so far major economic analysis of the TPP, will be on that call to introduce us to the arguments of the Tufts analysis, but also to help us debunk, to understand uh, 
to debunk the uh, t the ITC report and help us understand the arguments that we need to bring to our elected officials, who we can be sure will be hearing from the Obama administration after the release of that report about what an economic boon TPP will be. So this will be a critical call for us to understand some of the most important arguments that we need to bring to our elected officials as the uh, and the timing is perfect because right around that time Congress is going into a six week recess great time for us to set up meetings with our elected officials meet with them when they're in district and present these facts to them and try to get hard and fast commitments from them uh, that they are against TPP, and because one of the nice things about a six-week recess is if we can't get those commitments, that's lots of time for us to organize big protests outside their offices. So those are the calls coming up. Please join us again, folks. You can register or tell other people to register for those webinars at tradejustice.net slash callreg. Please direct people to our webpage at tradejustice.net and our Facebook page at Trade Justice Alliance. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next week. All right, and again, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Q&A session is over. And I'm going to open up the line. Thank you so much. The call will be posted in the list in 10 minutes. Thank you, Andrea. I really appreciate it. That's a great call. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Andrea. Thank, thank, thank you, everybody. It's a great day. Good night, everybody. Good night. 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 Good night.